for her, so no politics aside, but that's why I put that here, because at least probably a chance people saw that one. Um, so yeah, so we're here to talk about the why we built this thing, how it was built, some of the technology that's actually in it, and then a bunch of the things that we learned over the last basically three months of having this thing on the road. So uh, questions as they come up, feel free to ask, or if you want to talk about things afterwards, that's cool too. Um, so why an art truck? Uh, so the idea came about in 2019. Um, basically, galleries are failing to, I'm just like standing in the way of some people, so sorry, but so galleries are failing to sell, but they're expensive. There's this whole notion of like pay to hang, right? So you can pay anywhere from like 500 to like a couple thousand dollars to hang your art in a gallery for a month. And then they still take a commission off of every sale. So it's a really expensive game. And we also really found out that they actually don't bother to try to sell your art anymore because they're making all the money off of the hanging. So really sort of wasn't working. Art shows, like different like, communities will have or things like that, they're expensive, they're exhausting because they're very long days. And there actually wasn't really a good demographic overlap for her artwork with a lot of the different shows, especially around these areas where a lot of them can be more landscape centric and, and country centric and stuff like that. And, she trends a little bit more to the, to the psychedelic side of it. Um, we had built, I'd built out actually this foldable and collapsible art cart so that she could just sort of show up and do artwork wherever, and that was working really well. So we'd like take that down to like the Jersey Shore, she'd sit on the boardwalk and paint and like get lots of interaction with people, like take it to art shows and then be able to sort of set up wherever she wanted and also be able to paint at the same time. So that concept had actually sort of played out well. It's also based on, it's best to see art in person. There's real texture to artwork that you can't always really see through a photo. Um, and then this is also like the first step in a larger traveling art experience where we're actually gonna have collectors of hers host art shows either at their houses, their businesses, or in their communities at different parts of the US. So the truck in that aspect is sort of like the first step into an interesting engagement model of that. And then also, um, we're big believers in psychomagic, and this is sort of like a psychomagic experience, right? Like you're driving along, you don't really expect to see art like out of the corner of your eye and different things along those lines. So that's sort of the why in this. Um, so the design, right? So started sketching this thing out and playing around with it in 2019, and it was either modify or build a new cap truck. Um, had factors like height for parking garages and stuff like that. So no matter what, I can't be in anything that's under like seven foot six, even with it set up the way that it is now. Um, big enough to show larger art. Uh, Chrissy tends to do bigger pieces of art format. So the, the smallest on the side in the back, the 24 inches roughly, that's sort of as small as she'll get. Um, so figuring out how to make it fit with bigger was an issue. Secure, I mean, mostly it's theater of security, just like <laughs> anything in the real world, it, it's defeatable. Whatever, but at least some rough notion of it. A lighting system to illuminate the art, especially at night and stuff along those lines, obviously. Um, and then cameras um, from, once again, theater of security, but also to capture, really primary to capture like human interactions with the art and stuff along those lines and show what the art has seen, if you will. Um, as a little bit of a side note, ever since about like 2017, every painting she has done, she has recorded the entire process of painting them. So we have like several terabytes of <laughs> her painting all the pieces. And so when collectors get it, they also have the option to get the original content from when the piece was created. And it also exists as an interesting method for verification that the artwork is original. But that's a whole different side topic. Um, so cap, the actual build of the cap. Uh, so this started in and around April of this year. Bought the pickup truck, started driving around to like regular shops, that sell caps when I looked at Google and everyone was basically either telling me I was stupid or I was gonna have to buy like an $8,000 cap that had like a six or more week lead time to then just tear it apart and put the windows in it and everything like that. Um, wound up finding an Amish company to do it that was 15 minutes from my house. So this was actually built by Gap Hill Aluminum. Um, I basically walked in with the plan of this. They looked at it and they said, okay, so it's a work cap with windows instead of toolboxes. Fine, four weeks, I can have it done for you. Um, <laughs> and a lot less money actually than I was seeing 
for everything else. Um, the windows I had to source and get for them, they're from a company Polymer Shapes that is out of, outside of Philadelphia. The windows are quarter inch um, Lexane. So nothing special about them, just off the shelf Lexane. I looked into UV resistant Lexane. Um, those windows would have been about $10,000 if you go UV because your minimum orders for UV are very high. Um, so I also would have been in the business of selling UV protected you know, Lexane as a side. Um, yeah, just sort of, we'll get to it. One of them is not needed. Um, so the, the Lexane also has a, a bit of a UV um, degradation sort of like, or, or suppression on its own right. Um, so then the next question came into like, how do you actually mount the art? Um, and it's actually just sort of like really simple and stupid. Those are just big pieces of plywood painted and then those little hooks that sort of go around it just get screwed in from the back. Um, and they just have like little, I used uh, rubber insulation for like window insulation to sort of protect them. And it's literally been to its word, simple, and it works. Um, and so that, I thought that was gonna be a lot more complicated. And talk about like the things you initially like way over an engineer, I was like, I'm gonna have this aluminum panel with like these sliding brackets and shit. Like, no, it's just plywood, and if I put too many holes in, I buy a new one. Um, so that was that. So lighting and shades. Um, so lighting. Um, that is sort of like, yeah, like the first sort of run of it that we had going, and it's how it basically looks today. The criteria for that one was diffuse, no visible bulbs. Right? So these are behind sort of the edges of the window, so you didn't want like shining pieces of light on it. I wanted it to be 12 volt or USB powered. Actually wound up with a USB powered one. Uh, CIE, CIE standard, so light actually has standards. Um, and this is a French organization that winds up spending, specifying all of your different types of light specifications. Basically we failed at that. I couldn't find rope lighting that was of a CIE spec. Um, I may be able to find it eventually, but the ones that I did see, they had all the, they weren't diffuse. Um, and so I wound up with that company's neon LED strips um, for the shades. And so the reason for the shades was we didn't know how people were going to react to this, either to the art or to just from like a community standpoint. So before we went out on the road and did our different travels and stuff like that, I wanted the ability to basically be able to shut this thing down <laughs> if a cop asked me or if someone in the community sort of said like, hey, we don't like this. Or I just felt like maybe the environment was getting a little sketchy. Um, so the shades are actually just like really simple pieces of fabric with a metal bar in the bottom of them. And it's just a copper rod that they're taped onto. And that little round disc with the pin going through it that locks into the side of it is how I raise them and lower them. So just nice, dead simple. Um, it won't damage the art. Um, if it, we've actually had it where the screw has backed up and the shade has fallen, and they are towards the front, and they just fall straight down, they don't, they don't hit anything. Um, so that's the shades part of it. Um, power. Um, so, yeah, running the electronics that are in here and getting into that part of the business. This was done by Smucker's Energy, out by me over in Whitehorse. Uh, at least they helped me with picking out the inverter and the battery. So the charge inverter, it's massive overkill. It was just like a used one that they had lying around and was able to give me like a really good de deal on. Like, um, battery was an AGM, uh, 100, 180 amp hours roughly. I can get a full night of running the lights and be totally fine with it. The only downside of it is the 130 pound battery. Um, but it's a heavy duty truck, so it's not that big a deal, but it, it was actually a factor for our travels because the travels we did this summer, we were actually pushing max weight capacity of the truck. So there is a second battery, but I chose not to put it in once I realized I could at least get the lighting definitely going the whole night through. Um, and then there's 12 volt to USB converters. And I wound up having to use two different types of them, um, namely because the first converter that I got didn't handle the, the drop that was going on with the long USB cables that I needed to get the cameras run. Um, and so I wound up on the road switching over to these, this buck module. Um, I think what was happening there is they were allocating out the amperage to each of the four ports individually, whereas that one was just a single port, so it was just dumping it all to it. 
So I, I, that's my guess on it. I didn't really have an ability to test it or, or dig into it. Oh, so it actually has a short connection. Um, if I want to in the future, I can put a solar panel up on the top of the truck. And there's actually one that we were looking at was about like $300 to $400 that would actually charge it probably in about half a day or so um, was what we did some of the calculations on. But right now, we haven't really felt the need for it because um, I'm able to charge it up, just run it off of a 20 amp connection hooked into it for the short connection, it's hour, it's pretty close to tapped off. And then it'll, the charge control will continue to like exercise it and do like a final fill of the battery for, I feel like it's almost as long as I want, like have it plugged in. I've never walked, I've left it on for, plugged in for like a couple days and I've never walked out and it's like charging done. It always seems like it's trying to pack more in. But maybe that's just a message that it says on there. Um, so. It wound up being an interesting challenge. So this was in June when we went to go do the electronics on this and get this squared away. Ran into the chip shortage problem. So initially wanted to do Pi Zeros with their cameras and test out different cameras on that and couldn't get them. Um, if I was getting them, they were over $100 on eBay. And even some of the Facebook ones where I was like, yeah, all right, maybe it's a scam or not, they were a scam. Um, and so I basically just had to go with these like all-in-one little cameras. And I, the main thing was is I wanted it to be able to web stream with RTSP. Um, so those are the little cameras, and that's sort of roughly where they are in the, the windows. And then I sort of wanted to have a view that while we were driving or we were in a restaurant or out at a different event or something, we could sort of see what the truck was seeing. Um, and so used Motion iOS on a Raspberry Pi 3 um, and then a Wi-Fi router to sort of connect everything up to get together. The thing we ran into, and I still haven't solved for, is, is a dysfunctional amount of lag with these cameras um, when we're trying to view it live. It's like several minutes, if not more, off from one another. And it's really disorienting when you're sitting in the truck driving and it's like, cornfield on one side, business development in another, and it's like you're like seeing two different, three different movies playing simultaneously. So it just, it was just too obnoxious to look at. Like Chrissy and even when the kids wanted to look at it, they were like, no, this does not work. Um, so we didn't really get that. That's not solved yet. <laughs> so that has more work in play. So we have local connection, but we can also bridge like uh, an iPhone against it and use that as like sort of like a hotspot. So we were playing around with that a bit here and there. And I, yeah, like because the range of the Wi-Fi is, especially because it's inside that aluminum container, I think it brings it down a bit too. Like I'm probably at like 30 feet maybe, roughly, and then it starts to get a little bit shady. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we didn't really run it that much while we were driving. Like, we did some experiments here and there. Um, we also didn't get signs made to say, hey, this is recording. So we sort of were, like, on the back and forth about that. So that didn't go as far as we wanted to, or, and it will go there. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's sort of the plan there. Um, so we did our first run with it in... Early June, we did a trip down to Asbury Park, New Jersey, and it works. We actually had someone on Route 30 scan the QR code on it and comment about loving it. <laughs> like, and we weren't sitting still <laughs> at any point on that road. So, and and we we actually checked with with that person, and they weren't the one driving. Um, <laughs> So, because that's been a concern of ours, is, is creating distraction and making things unsafe. Um, but that was the first run with it, and so it gave us a lot of confidence going in. And so what this thing has survived so far. So we did a 12,000 mile summer road trip um, this summer. So it's a little hard to see, but the black lines are where we went. Um, we maxed out at about 105 to 108 degrees outside of Dripping Springs, New, um, Texas. Um, only thing that sort of happened with that is this like decorative gasket material shrank a little bit, um, but it's really hard to notice anyway. And then we ended at Burning Man, and so it survived the dust and everything like that, basically no problem. 
and just sort of like the heat and aggressiveness of that. Um, first couple of days, we could have the lights on at night and it was no big deal. But after the first couple of days, the dust buildup inside was getting to the point where it was just sort of like too foggy to turn the lights on at night. And I didn't really want to start washing it. Um, the one thing about the Lexane is it scratches insanely easily. So it's like not something I really wanted to mess with. I had the stuff there to do it, but I just didn't want to deal with it. Plus also, the sand at Burning Man is a super fine alkaline sand. And once you start to get it moist, it turns to like rock. So if you don't get it off, it just becomes even worse to deal with. Um, so that's what it, it, it basically survived. Um, one of the things during this whole time is we actually had like different analytics on it. On the truck is a QR code that people can scan and interact with. Um, that QR code is going to Linktree right now, which just provides like a list of like different social media things and the option for people to do a donation to buy us gas. No one's bought us gas. Um, <laughs> But that's okay. Um, it's also the destination on her business cards and for some of her social media links. Um, ChrissyWhiskey.com, we have Google Analytics on that one. Facebook, she has a personal page. Personal stats these days on Facebook is basically, it's really limited. Um, for her Facebook art page, that has a little bit more and we'll get into some of this a little bit more here in a second. Um, and then for Instagram, she has her art account. She has TikTok and YouTube, but they don't really play that well when we were doing this traveling um, with that type of stuff. So um, Google Analytics, this was probably some of the best data that we were getting out of it. There, for anyone who went to the website, that was really good geo data. Like we did some tests of it ourselves where we like were getting onto it from different areas. Um, the one thing that we did test and confirmed is that cell phone providers, they can use whatever IP address they sort of feel like um, for a device. And so we were often seeing 500 mile differences for where, like we'd be standing in front of it in Glacier National Park and it's like, no, you're out in, you know, Missoula or something like that. Like it was, that was an interesting aspect to sort of see how far off that could be. Um, we're going to move our QR codes to being wrapped with Google Analytics uh, soon. Um, Linktree, um, they had limited geo data and it was, it seems a bit worse than, than Google's was. I, I, my inkling is they're probably not updating the SWIP information off of the different IP addresses that often is my guess. Yeah. Uh, SWIP is, um, so for every IP address, uh, it's sort of like you get to give like the surrounding information for it, like it's address information and things along those lines. So that's my guess on it, um, but it's hard to tell. But the one big issue that we have with Linktree is we're not able to differentiate the source. So we can't tell if it's the QR code from a business card or someone clicking on the link from the website and stuff like that. We paid for the more pro version of it and it didn't unlock any features to help out with that one. Very good solution though, if you need something quick and easy. Um, you need different yeah, that's really what you would wind up needing and that's sort of a pain and yeah. Um, and also be, in general, we feel a little bit more confident in the data that was coming out of Google. Like when we're doing the side-by-side -side tests with it, we locations were way off often even more for Linktree in comparison to Google when we were testing it in the field. Um, Facebook personal, um, I don't know how familiar people are maybe with this, but it really is limited because it only has a 28 day view of history and there's no way to see people by source. So that's like, it just, this really starts to hit on like the closed wall mentality aspect that you start to run into in the Facebook ecosystem in particular. Um, and it, it, it wound up basically being the same thing for her paid page. And she actually has like a decent amount of followers, so she's got a decent amount of functionality unlocked in there. So I don't know if there's another level that she'd reach of granularity of data if she had more users um, on the Facebook page. But 
you get some deeper data on posts and stuff like that, but once again, like no real source information to say like this is where the person was when they engaged with it or any of that like real world context. It, for for that one, it's a little hard to say. Like, because like also, I mean, oh, have, yeah, have Brazil, yeah. right? And that's a personal one, right? And we know that like there's actually a lot of people in Brazil that like our artwork. Okay. So there's a number of Brazilian artists that like play in some familiar veins with it. Um, so like that one, we've actually been able to say isn't like some bot farm that went crazy in in Brazil. It's pretty legit to the point where it's like she usually has a tab up for Portuguese translation, you know, to like, yeah, like it's a weird, but they don't transfer to the business page, right? Like you don't see them anywhere in that top list of it. So it's like the weird demographics of things and stuff. And that's also mostly because for like her business page, most of that growth is through like paid advertising at this point and targeted. And she just finds it easier to target people here in the US in different demographic areas than to do the international um, aspect. Plus, shipping art to Brazil is not cheap. Um, and she doesn't ship art anymore. It's all hand delivery. And so that flight is an expensive flight um, compared to most of the US and other stuff. Uh, her Instagram art account, there it got at least, you got like at least a 90 day rolling window of stuff. But once again, no geo data on users. And the insane irony of this is location matters for when you post. So like when you're geographically in a location, when you're posting, it'll boost that post higher in that area. And so it's really sort of mind blowing to us that this feature doesn't sort of exist, that you have no sense of like where people are interacting. You just get to assume that it's the location that you're in. Um, but, and once again, also no way to sort of see sources of where people are or coming from or how they came in. Um, so how we know it works. <laughs> uh, watching people interact from afar. So parking the truck out in front of a restaurant where we can sit down and watch it and watch people interact with it. Um, you know, we'll get better with the cameras and that'll make that a little bit easier and stuff along those lines. Um, very manual tracking of like new followers and interactions. So literally looking at an account before we would go into a town and say, okay, user counts here, blah, 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 like dump that list out, you know, okay, interactions were here and there on different posts. And so it was just very manual. And then also just occasional comments on post. So like there was like, you know, saw you in Zion today, right? Like, I mean, that's some proof that it was working. Um, and that's a park ranger who made a stop in front of their booth so that they could take photos of it. So like you get those. And then very impactful conversations um, in the sense of like we had one family park next to us at a camp where um, the lady next to us like made this really big point to have, like she obviously like nerded out overnight on Chrissy's artwork and the next morning was like, I love it, this feels awesome, but and she was like, you never pull, paint older women. And like, this was like a really big important thing for Chrissy to be able to hear directly, have a conversation about it, for her to talk and say like, well, okay, well, here's my, you know, a lot of the time she's like, I feel like I'm painting myself or reflections of myself in my artwork, not, and I haven't really seen myself as an older person yet. And then it's also really, she paints pretty loose and open. She's like, it's hard to get some of the details of an older face into there. But it was impactful enough to where she, you know, coming home, she's like, I'm going to play with that and I'm going to work on it. And I think like that's the part that gets unlocked. And then in following some like the manual interactions, it's, it's a clear bypass of the algorithms that take place. Uh, she got a whole series of followers out of the Austin and Dripping Springs, Texas area that were actually, I, I think we wound up in the, around some religious organizations get together or something because about like more than like 10 different pastors signed up <laughs> to follow her artwork there. And that demographic would have probably have not have found her organically with the different algorithms and reach. And these people love the artwork, comment on it, interact with it all the time. And when things maybe get a little political or stuff like that, they're actually cool. 
Like it's, it, it hasn't turned into problems. So that's probably been one of the biggest side benefits that we've seen is that, that bypassing of algorithmic reach um, by going out and doing it in the real world. Um, so learnings, build and tech. Um, UV damage does not appear to be happening. The artwork can actually go past the edge of the truck. The, 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 the cases are big enough to hold bigger pieces of artwork. And we've seen no lines or changes in color down the art as a result of it. Um, and then we've also just, we have a couple photographers that we work with who are able to photograph her work at very high qualities. And we did before and we've done after and we've compared them and we're not seeing any differences on them. Uh, condensation is not a problem. It was one of the things that we were worrying about because basically those are like greenhouse windows borderline on the side of a truck. Top of the truck cap is white, um, but it wound up not being a problem. I thought I was going to have to put ventilation in and fans and stuff like that. It wound up not being an issue, and heat isn't a problem. It winds up being pretty leaky um, because the truck bed itself has the mounts for a fifth wheel heat hitch, so that leaks, and then the front and back of it had gaps for like water to run out of the bed anyway. So like the actual cap build itself is pretty watertight. Like we've really not had any leaks come into it, but I think there's enough airflow underneath to sort of help it out. Well, did somebody take care of the sand that you were talking about? Well, that's how the sand got in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you find anything to address getting it out? Oh yeah, a lot of cleaning. I got home last Thursday, I cleaned for four days. <laughs> yeah, a vinegar water. <laughs> um, so it, 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 yeah, it takes a lot to get that one out of there. Um, the plexiglass, the camera lag, I talked about that. Night vision cameras don't work because they reflect off of the inside of the glass, so it just turns into a big halo. Um, so that was an interesting learn. The geodata, we talked about those. Um, and the insights hit about those. So that was the build and tech learnings. Real world, um, being stuck in traffic is now a good thing. Um, our interaction rates when we're in high traffic days is way higher. Um, the back window gets more interaction. Uh, so like when we had like the trailer on it, like it's just the time that people are going past it. And they, you'll see people do like a quick like out of the corner of their eye, but they got to focus on driving or, or they're already past and it's not there. So the back of the truck actually winds up having a lot of impact. Um, and I talked about the exposure bypasses the limit of algorithms. Big thing is few people looking up. Um, in major downtowns, driving slow, people are either at their devices or they're walking and they're paying attention and they're walking. They do not look up that frequent. So we got to build the sound system for it. Yeah, I don't drive with the lights on on the artwork. Oh, for parking, like when we're parked? When you're parked, you do get more interaction, I think, because it's like it's close to like the sidewalk, especially if I'm able to get close to like a sidewalk, right? Like, and like, a, like as a side note, parking attendants, 40 bucks will get you anywhere in a parking spot if they can make it happen. Okay. Um, and that works out really well when you're at like at the beach or something like that and you want a spot that's like in a good corner. Um, so yeah, so like we're gonna do something We'll start with just like a Bluetooth speaker and just start to see like how much noise we need to make to get people's attention. And then the other thing from the real world is the fantastic conversations that I talked about. What do you want to play over the speakers? So we'll probably actually play music that she's paint that she listened to while painting the pieces. Um, so like because we have the recordings, we have the timestamps of what she listens to. So we go into Spotify and actually pull what she listened to those days. So we have a curated list of the influences for each piece of artwork. So that's maybe like a start point. We'll have to see some of it, like we have to start thinking about content and appropriate content for some of it. Like some of it definitely is not kid friendly. Um, so we'll have, to, we'll have to play with that and figure that out. Um, but next steps, uh, the basic next steps are uninvited, un uninvited attendance at different locations. Um, it's really sort of like the whole point of it. So starting to show up at first fire day events and just park on, you know, in front of the busiest looking gallery. Um, art shows. She has a lot of collectors that are neurologists and stuff like that. So we're going to start going to neurology conventions with it and just like park in front of them. 
Um, so just taking basically all the demographic information that we know and playing it out in the real world. Uh, modifying the rear door to allow fully 24 inch high art. Um, that's just some welding and some different things like that. Sound system, no lag, and the QR codes. So those are sort of roughly like the next steps for this ad adventure. Um, and then I just figured I'd throw up links for us and stuff like that if anyone's interested. Yeah? So I have two questions. Sure. We didn't change them while we were driving because we didn't have a place to store more art. The entire back of the truck was filled with boxes for Burning Man and our bicycles and generators and everything like that. So, so for that one, it was it's four, two on the back, one on each side. On uh, the configuration that we have it now, it's one on one side, two on the other, one on the back. Um, and eventually we'll build racks to be able to put them in and be able to like actually slide racks out if we want to. Have you thought about having a place for a certain uh, period of time that actually put Oh, like standing up above it? There I'd be worried about wind. So I don't know that I'd really go for any structures like like that's takes some effort. I wasn't thinking driving, I think. No, 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 but I'm saying even standing still. So like with the art show experiences, like we had it where we had our tent set up. So the tent setup that we use at art shows, it has 200 pounds of concrete weights and then it has 300 pounds of steel racking holding it down. And we've still had it shake. So like when you're, those canopies, and then if you have sidewalls on them, they just catch a lot of air. So I'm very skeptical when it's time for me to mount art vertically in wind. Absolutely. That's like one of the main learnings that we dug into it and we re I reached out to some, actually I didn't even really need to reach out to anyone. I thought I was going to have to. But Google basically provided the answers, which is to say through the cell phone providers, it's like a known issue. There's, there's nothing that gives them pressure to accurately tie you to an IP address that's near where you are. So it's just up to them to decide when or how it happens. and. And, then, and how we were finding it out to get a little bit more drilled into there, which is literal tests with us, where sometimes we would do it, we'd interact, and be able to sort of see it, you know. There's like usually like an hour or two lag before it shows up in the different analytics tools, but, you know, we were in some incredibly rural areas where we know we were the only people <laughs> interacting with it. <laughs> yeah? I don't run the lights on it when we're driving. Okay, well that's yeah, like I've, I've, we've been really intentional about that. It's also why we haven't done the sound system type component yet. I know here in Lancaster there's a company that buys used cars and I think they have like a wrapped pickup truck, tow truck and car and they have like big speakers on it and they drive around with that. But no, you're absolutely right like on the different sensibilities and different regulations of different communities and that's why I built those shades because we didn't. Yeah. Right. No, no, no. Like, 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 and, and the biggest thing there is, is I, I, I sort of felt like we come at it from a mindset of like, we're cool with asking forgiveness. Um, we did that with the, and we learned that with the art cart, right? Like when we'd wind up on the beach, right? Like, like, was she supposed to have a busking license or not in different communities? No, she wasn't selling any artwork. And so like different communities would deal with that different. And so we took that sort of experience and, and learning how to have those conversations and said, okay, well, we're just gonna be doing this then on the road if it shows up. Um, um.
it might take you a little looking to see what suits you guys best. You want to find engagement with parades. Run your vehicle through a parade. You're going to get, people are going to be getting your cell phones out, they're going to be scanning that QR code. Yeah, we actually got invited that day we went down to Asbury was like uh, like Gay Pride Month kickoff in Asbury. So they actually tried to invite us into it and to be a part of it. And we were just like literally like, we don't know how the hell this thing works or how like stuff is going to play out. Like we're totally awesome about coming back next year. But we were just sort of like it was all like real last minute. We just didn't have time to think about it. Like and we were just like greatly appreciate the opportunity but we'll pass for right now. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I think that is, I think it's that and like car shows and stuff like that. I, we actually, when we were in, when we were outside of Glacier, I went to one. Um, and that was an interesting thing to sort of like see all the car guys sort of be like, because actually you're just rolling up with a truck with a cap on it. They're like, what the hell? Like, you know, like this isn't anything. And then they'd walk around and be like, oh shit, okay, this is a little different. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, it's not a sales pitch. Yeah, no, no, no. Like, that's, yeah. And if it comes a little sales pitch, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm, uh, I'm doing the research. I might as well help others. All right. Anything else before we wrap up here, real quick? Did you sell any on the road? No. Um, Did you plan not to sell any on the road? Uh, she had actually made a posting before she started the trip that sales weren't going to be happening um, because it's hand delivered. Yep. There's really no way to do that. Um, but yeah, we never really hit. We never hit a model that we didn't put any pricing information on it, and we didn't have links for each artwork to go buy it. So, no, no, it didn't. It didn't really reach that point. I think if it was parked in an environment and we were sitting with it longer, rather than it being on our travels, like I think some of those engagements may have been able to happen a bit more. But it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, for, for concept, like, the one girl on the side, I think that's, like, 8,000. Um, so that's, yeah, you're, plus they also come with contracts. So people have to sit down and spend the time to actually read over the contract and make sure they're comfortable with it and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's spur of moment to get the commitment and start to make the buy, but actually fully closing and delivering on the deal t usually takes a bit of some time. Yeah. Very much, yep. Thank you.